Okay, so basically from now on we have we have those lecture recordings and I can put them on there. Okay, so welcome to experimental design for machine learning. And this class, um, um, I can promise you, is a little bit different from what you expect. Let me give you let me give you my background. Um, I well, I'm teaching here at, at Berkeley and in the X department, and people may know me from CS88. Uh, which I basically uh, co-founded with David Culler. And he, he, this is a sort of the class that go from, uh, from data science into sort of, hey, this is computer science um, for undergraduates. And other than that, um, I'm also running a discussion group at the Berkeley Institute, data, uh, Berkeley Institute for Data Science on information and uncertainty. And other than that, I'm also a CTO now. I used to be a, a, a principal scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and I decided to that. And I'm a CTO of my own AI company now, where we do measurements of machine learning. And you will learn a lot about measurements in this, um, in this class. And you will also most likely get a demo version, most likely because actually we want you to give a demo version, but um, it's, we need to be ready for that. Okay, so. Um, personally, I started working machine learning uh, in 2001. That was when machine learning wasn't cool yet. Okay, <laughs> nobody cared about it, and I did neural networks and learned about backpropagation, and nobody cared. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, and then later on, uh, so I because nobody cared, I went into the multimedia field because I was really excited about it, and it's still really exciting. And in fact, it's even more exciting than before. And, and right now my research is a little bit shifting more into the fundamentals of machine learning again, but this class is gonna be exactly a healthy mixture of both. And uh, in terms of multimedia content, um, I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago that really explains, for example, how JPEG and MPEG and all these things work and from a computer scientist perspective, which I obviously highly recommend because if you actually really wanna work with video, it's good to know how, they actually, how it actually is encoded and how it works. Um, I also did a book uh, with, with a grad student of mine, J.M. Choi, on location estimation. That was a task where we took videos and wanted to find out where were they recorded. It was a really interesting task. And it was started in parallel by Avide Zakor, um, um, Alyosha Efros, and me. And that was while Alyosha was still at CMU. And it was independent, kind of weird. We all had this idea of let's do this. And we just did it in parallel with, with, very, with different results and different approaches. And because of that, we decided, hey, let's write it all up in one book. And this is the book you see in the middle. And then I still have a huge passion for teaching, obviously. And, and that passion um, lately resulted in me writing a book for elementary school on learning programming with like a 1980s computer. And the reason why I chose the 1980s computer is because they were low, low, low complexity. You, you turn that on and you can say a sound uh, and three parameters and it makes a sound. Try that in Python. Not even Python is that low complexity. So that was, um, you know, something that's there. And right now I'm, I'm working on number four, which is basically the book that would accompany this class. And you will see chapters evolving as, as sort of extra material as the class goes on. Um, so stuff I did, for example, in, in the 2006, I released a tool that's still in GIMP. You, if you download the GIMP, it's like a Photoshop, an open source Photoshop. If you download that and you use this tool that has this ICANN extract foreground using Cyox algorithm, the Cyox algorithm is uh, sort of my PhD thesis. <laughs> and so uh, it's been in there for, for the last 15 years. If you want to take a look at that, it's kind of a neat algorithm to separate foreground from background using user interaction, but obviously saving a lot of user interaction um, compared to having to do it manually. Um, so, and, and so that was sort of my first uh, foray into, into AI. And I'm, I'm sort of in the academic community more known for this, which is a corpus of 100 million images and a million videos, um, which we released for research with annotations and a whole Wikipedia community around it, which we call the multimedia commons. And late, lately, uh, the whole, this whole approach was negatively in the press. Um, I always say, you know, everybody can be excited, but being negatively in the press is also something because then you basically really have had an impact, uh, even though that sounds bad. But the point is they were criticizing us on privacy uh, infringement. And um, to be frank, they were partially right, partially wrong. 
as usual. And so we fix the things they were right about and, and uh, we are working on actually expanding this corpus. Um, and um, so basically we want to have something like YFCC 1000M where you get, get go to a, a billion images or something like this. Um, we'll see if we can do it. We're still working on it. But the interesting thing is this corpus is available to you, including a bunch of tools that you could use, for example, for this class, but you don't have to, um, to take a, take a look at that. Um, and yeah, it's, a, it's basically, uh, it's, a, it's a very nice resource to have. And just for information, this is uh, from J.M. Choi, a, a geolocation task sort of that he implemented in Jupyter Notebook so people can just go in and do, so do some Python and then upload their own image and it will tell you sort of uh, a ranking of the, uh, the guesses uh, that it came up with for, for example, with that image of the, uh, of the I think that's, what is that? <laughs> I think that's in China, some river. I am not sure exactly what it is. Somebody can read the geo coordinates, please tell me. <laughs> I cannot read them, but that's basically what it was. So you can do stuff like this, but you don't have to. So um, why do we care in general? Well, we care in general because um, uh, there's more and more data on the internet. And it's pretty clear to me that data on the internet is free more and more. Um, and I mean, you can just build apps and make money, to be frank, by collecting the data in the right way and analyzing it in the right way. And lots of the data is videos, and lots of the data is, is, is audio, lots of the data is just text, and the combination of them really helps. But what's really interesting is that, you know, Darwin had to still travel to, you know, come up with his theory of evolution, like to the things through there and, and so on. And, and, we don't have to do this anymore. You can just go and say, okay, we want to see how evolution works. Maybe let's take all the videos of birds over a different time span, over a different location and so on, and study it this way. And more and more, this is what happens. And uh, partly this is where computer scientists and, and data scientists will be sought for, for helping you know, scientific endeavors that do empirical research for economics and medicine, sociology, and, and, and there's been COVID research, for example, right now conducted using YouTube searches to see like uh, people are reporting different symptoms. Maybe, you know, there's an overlap. Maybe it's not, you know, what can we say about these people? What are they saying? Because you can get a lot more than, um, than just, you know, what you can write down. You know, an image says more than a thousand words and there's nothing better than something that's not in a lab. You know, it's outside of a lab. It's real world, somebody reporting them himself. Oh, I think I have COVID. Oh, now I tested positive. Interesting. Why do you think you had it? What were your symptoms? Way more interesting than just the people that we actually get. So we get at a, a higher reach by analyzing uh, internet data, right? Big problem is, uh, and of course, there's a recent buzzword called big data. But the big problem is that right now, Google and Amazon, hmm, what is going on? Well, the big problem is that right now, Google and Amazon are completely monopolizing the space. It seems like you want to work on this, you have to work for Google. You want to work on this, oh, you can work for Amazon, or you can switch between the two to make more money. No. <laughs> Point is, no. I mean, I have students, grad students, and other grad students who work effectively with, a, with 100 million images, OK? Now, granted, yes, we need some extra compute for this. You cannot do it on your laptop. But we don't need clusters or compute centers for it. We need to just be smart about how we deal with this. And that's basically what I teach in this class. Like, how can you be smart? How can you build neural networks that are small and still do the job? How can you do all of this effectively? And maybe, you know, in 10 years, really just from your laptop. And yeah, that's what this class is about. So, and it's kind of interesting because I was doing a couple of years ago, I was doing the exact same thing. I was saying, okay, we need money, 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 because we need compute. And then Amazon asked a crucial question. So I have very good contacts with Amazon because uh, again, we, we, um, we had, um, uh, we had uh, the, the, 
uh, this YFCC 100M corpus that I said before makes Amazon money. They host it, and as you download it, it's for free for you, but for industry, it's not. And so then it makes the money. So that's really nice. But so I can go and say, hey, can you give us like a 100K research grant or something, right? And it's really simple. But one of the times I asked them, okay, so there's a student who wants to do a deep learning experiment with a huge neural network. Can we get some EC2 research money? And they asked a very simple question back. They asked, how much? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, uh, good question. And then what we did is we just looked at the state of the art. We said, okay, how long does it take to train an AlexNet, a DarkNet, a VGG16? And it turns out that's not an answer because an AlexNet is a 238 megabyte model, right? This is sort of the net to do right image net tasks right now. And the same image net task is solved with a DarkNet with 28 megabyte of model and 0.96 billion operations of training. And VGG16, however, has twice the model of the original AlexNet, but then 10 times the training time. So, so what's going on here? This is not a measurement. This is several orders of magnitudes off. So, so the answer is, how much, what is the experimental design here? And of course, that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> how do I design an experiment? How do I even budget for a deep learning experiment? without knowing, I mean, if I just look at what's out there, it doesn't give me an answer. So there must be a more structured answer to that, right? Um, and this is how this entire line of work started a couple of years ago that I'm gonna to present to you um, and make this practical. And so what I'm gonna to present to you in this class is a systematic approach based on computer science a little bit of information theory, but mostly computer science um, for the experimental design of machine learning experiments. Because if you think about it, uh, for example, a neural network is nothing else but sort of a computer that you're building and then simulating. And I will show, I will explain to you this later. So your computer science knowledge is the most important one. Secondarily, we'll, we'll talk a lot about bits um, because the bit is really a useful measurement unit for this. Um, so yeah, there is some theory that's basically half of the lecture is, is theory, but it's not the theory that you're used to. It is, it's mostly measuring, okay? So it's not like we're gonna prove and, and, and oh, please prove this, please prove that. There's gonna be some homework like this, but it's not about proving, it's more about thinking. It's more about, okay, um, how is it that you could do this and not that, right? Um, or, or um, uh, it, it's mostly about really thinking as an engineer. What do you think is the maximum you could use for this, the minimum you could use for that, and so on. So it's, it's, it, is, it is an explanation, but it's mostly philosophical um, and, and also mathematical, but not in the sense of, of standard math, math theory. And we will, in the end, then in the, in the second half, will be a lot more practical, um, but we will talk about single processing. So um, in computer science, usually there's not a lot of coverage about, well, what do we actually know about image compression? Um, what do we actually know about how to deal with audio? Or how do you combine those? Um, that's exactly sort of what my book is about that I said earlier, the multimedia book. And obviously, um, um, I'm going to present a bunch of that in the lecture. Um, and uh, we will also cover some side topics. For example, uh, adversarial examples. Um, uh, Bo Lee often gave guest lectures in this, uh, in this, um, in this uh, 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 class. Now, now with COVID, I don't know. I may have different people giving guest lectures. But it's also good to always keep a bigger perspective. And so we'll do that through guest lectures. Um, give me a sec. Here we go. So what's interesting here is, if you looked at this, I, 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 I created this class in 2011, actually. And what's interesting there is that in 2011, in 2012, it was a lot really, really, really like all of these like crowdsourcing, coping with memory and computational issues, information fusion, inferring from social graphs, which was interesting because it was a bunch of different methods. And if you compare the content to what happened, you know, 10 years ago to now, there's like one interesting theme. 
it's less anecdotal, okay? And so this is the most important thing for me. I know there's a lot of machine learning classes out there that just tell you Google does this, Facebook does this, Microsoft does this. I'm not interested in that. I'm really not interested in that. Um, what I'm interested in is why are we doing things, okay? And I want to hear why questions, okay? Please ask me why questions, <laughs> okay? I'm not embarrassed by why questions, okay? Why questions can be answered if you don't do anything anecdotal. If you do real science, then you can say, well, we do this because we need this, and we need this because this is how you know, it works. And not just, well, okay, resonance seems to be better. We don't know exactly why, but hey, it's better. And, and so that's just not how I work. Um, so I'm trying to be a lot more systematic and a lot less anecdotal. Um, so that means you will start with conceptual knowledge um, for machine learning measurement. And uh, one thing I totally want you to look at is the machine learning cheat sheet, okay? Um, now the old version is, as I said, linked. Um, you can start with the old version, it's not completely wrong but there's a much nicer version. The current version is version 101, if you ever want to know this. It's from August 2020. I just gave it a couple of small updates. I think the old version that is linked there is the 0.97, but I think if you scroll down, you get, I will fix this obviously, but if you were scrolling down on our class website right now, there is one of the versions is 1.01, and that's the version you want to look at. I will obviously get rid of the old versions. <laughs> um, so this machine learning cheat sheet starts with giving you sort of an initial idea, right? So intelligence is the ability to adapt is the first definition there. And now we have to understand how do we go from the ability to adapt to machine learning, right? So what are we actually adapting, right? So a machine learner is adapting, uh, is an algorithm that adapts to the data, right? And then we want to adapt it in a way that when it sees unseen data, it can then actually, uh, you know, sort of carry that adaption on, right? And, and predict unseen data. And how this works, you'll see. So, and what I do in order to think less anecdotal, in order to give you an answer to why questions, why am I telling you to do it this way and not the other way, is we will be very, very close to the scientific process. We will do actual science, every single engineering, Discipline is based on science, mostly on physics. And it turns out for me that often I see machine learning is just based on statistics and there's smart math. But the trick about science is that science needs to be rooted in observations. And in order to predict observations, it's very good to keep it to science. Um, and I will show you about the scientific process, how machine learning fits in, and then a lot of measurements that go beyond accuracy. Everybody knows how to measure accuracy, but I will also tell you a lot of problems with accuracy. I will give you, I will, I will let, you, let you understand the measurement of capacity. Capacity is actually really, really uh, important. Uh, then we will derive from capacity on how we measure generalization. And then uh, we will take the different things that people do into account. So for example, there's different types of training, different types of, for example, activation functions and neural networks. There's regularization, right? Then there's the concept of walking Razor. How does this all connect? I will explain that to you and um, the way I see it and how, we, how to take that and make it practical for you, okay? And then there's the very, very important point. When you do all of this, when you keep to this framework, then you get to the point where we can finally discuss reproducibility and repeatability. It is very, very interesting to me how many students have tried um, to, to actually try to reproduce an experiment that is in some paper and how difficult that is. And in the end they go, I succeeded, I cloned the GitHub and I get the same result. But that's not reproducing, that's repeating, okay? <laughs> so what you need to do there is you need to actually understand the difference. And once you understand the difference, I will, using this framework, you will understand how to get to reproducibility, not just repeatability, okay? Um, now, the experimental setup of machine learning is much more than just saying, okay, let's train AlexNet, right? <laughs> That's often what I hear. No, the, the, the point is you need 
annotator agreement. You need to have labeled data that is right. Unless you do unsupervised learning, which has its own problems, you need to have data that you can trust that the annotation is right. Now, how do you know you can trust the annotation is right? And well, maybe it's an easy task, cat versus dog, fine. But maybe it's emotion detection, now what? <laughs> and the trick here is that they actually have methods of measuring that the annotation is right. And one of them is annotator agreement, which you hopefully have heard about, and, but also how to do this right, for example, when it's temporal data. So now temporal data means what? You have a boundary of time and now three annotators say, well, it's one says it's second one, the other says it's second 1.1, and the third one is saying it's second 1.05. Who's right? The average? Maybe, but also how do we define this? How do we make sure then that we measured this, that actually gives us the baseline for machine learning. Because by the way, your machine learning is really better than your annotation. Um, and also, if it is, we want to detect that and know that it is, and not just, ha, oh, accuracy is high, right? That's the question. So, and then uh, we should talk about adversarial examples, mostly because they are hype uh, right now, and because they actually serve really well to understand sort of the notions of capacity and generalization. I worked uh, really intensively for about a year on understanding adversarial examples, sort of with Bully, who's, who's sort of the adversarial example person, uh, to to uh, to um, uh, put that into my into this framework of capacity and generalization. And then once you have all of this, then you can go and say, okay, first of all, I reached eighty-five percent accuracy. I cannot reach any more because the annotator agreement is ninety percent. Now, people hate that it's an eight in front and not a nine, but my resilience is 20 dB. That means my features can change by so and so much. We can add so and so much noise to each of these features and it will still uh, not have a different result. And that means since we saw a feature change of about five dB per year, that my model can, uh, you know, can last for four years, right? So you can do stuff like this which is really important because there's also stuff like model drift, but you want to basically be able to say as much as you can about your model, first of all, before you create it, and then also after you create it, right? If you buy a car, they're gonna give you a lot more than just speed. <laughs> you go and say, I buy a car. Yeah, max speed is uh, 180. Yeah, you could go and buy a car based on speed. I mean, that's something, but I tell you that even a race car driver would not do that. <laughs> even the race car driver would probably say, no, speed is not enough. I need to know a bunch of other factors. And that's true. You need to know a bunch of other factors about your model than just accuracy. It's, it's just what it is. And I'll give you those. Um, and then we'll talk about, once we have all of this, and we'll talk about something really depressing that will first feel depressing and then we'll feel hopefully will add to your understanding. After I gave you all this theory, you will apply this theory to audio and video and image data, and it will not work. <laughs> and the reason is that there is image, image, audio, and video data, perceptual data in general, needs some extra treatment, and then all the theory will work. And this is the reason why computer vision is its own field, it's sort of devoid from data mining. And we'll also explain why that is and what, what the, uh, um, a problem there is. And by the way, I just got a paper published and I presented two weeks ago on exactly this topic. Um, and um, I'm going to also show you that paper in, after, in a couple lectures, but it, you probably need a couple lectures to, to really enjoy this paper. And yeah, so there's intrinsics of perceptual data, intrinsics of audio, image, and video data. Um, and once you have all of this, um, or in parallel while you're learning all of this, here we go. Um, you, you will work on your project, right? So give me a second. Though. Okay. So now, um, my goodness. Sorry. Here we go. So especially because we have COVID, there's the lectures and I'm recording all of them. But then also there's the book um, that I wrote together with Ramesh Jain, who's really a computer vision slash, um, slash multimedia retrieval expert. And he had a couple of commercial systems out very early that would do uh, image retrieval. Um, and so I wrote this book with him. It covers basically the whole ground of um, multimedia computing sort of in the more traditional 2012 sense. And 
it, it will feel like, wait a minute, why isn't deep learning in there? Well, it's not in there because we're going to do it here. But well, that's also why there's another book needed that I'm currently working on. But the major point is what you have there is a very good fundamental, uh, very good fundamentals, including like how does compression work? You know, if you if you don't have a good uh, idea about entropy yet, that's something to read in there. How does zip actually work? How does JPEG actually work? These kind of things are described in there. Um, now, regularly, regularly, this book is available in the library. Um, if people have problems, by the way, I'm more than happy to hand out some copies of chapters when needed. Um, but it should be just downloadable, I think, from the Berkeley Library. Okay, so just as a student, you can log in and download chapters as far as I know. Um, but please let me know if there's any trouble getting this material. Okay, um, I'm not one of these professors saying you need to buy my books and make some money. That's not the point. Okay. <laughs> The point is, uh, I want you to read this, and um, it's available in the library. But we already spent some money on on the book, so uh, you should just get it. Um, and there will be more material as we go, as I said earlier. So regarding capacity, by the way, a book that's not an easy read, that's very theoretical but really nice and deep, is the book by McKay, Information Algorithms, um, Information. Uh, learning, I need to double check. So the one book by McKay, there's two. One is What Energy, the other one is the, the, the textbook by McKay. Um, it's completely available online. Um, it's also linked from my website. Um, and uh, it's just, it's in my office at uh, in, 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 in uh, Satyur Jadai. And if I had it in front of me, I would give you the title. I'm so sorry, but it definitely is linked from, from a website. And that has a chapter 40 that I will talk about a lot. Um, it's not an easy read, it's just eight pages, but these are eight super dense pages, okay? Eight pages that took basically me here to fully understand. But if you're into getting really into the depths of what's going on here, that's the book to have, okay? So um, I'm trying to, here we go. So how do you receive credit? Um, yeah, how do you receive credit? First of all, be here, please. Um, so this is one of these lectures where it's really important to kind of be there and ask questions. And um, we will probably use, as I said, the whiteboard that I just gave you. And um, I will add office hours so you, you can, you can uh, uh, you know, uh, ask questions, you will have them. Um, and in reality, what I want you to do is measure out a project, okay? <laughs> so you can create your own machine learning project. Maybe you want to work on the YFCC corpus because it's cool and I created it, blah, blah, blah. Um, but maybe you're actually working for some other professor and already doing some project. Yeah, do that for them. And now you can, uh, and now you can legally double dip. Be careful, it's not really double dipping. What I want you to do for me is to take what you do there and question it using the methods that I give you, okay? So this has been done before by the students who took the class earlier. For example, there was an active learning class with uh, um, Sergey Levine, and one of the students said, okay, cool, I'm gonna do the active learning project for Sergey, and then I'm gonna uh, uh, take all of this, what I did, measure it out, and actually improve my experimental design, <laughs> and say how I improved my experimental design using measurements, and, and submit that to Gerald. And guess what? They got uh, basically an A in both classes. That's how you do it, okay? So, because Sergey really liked that this was actually well designed and worked. And I really like that somebody questioned using the methods that I created and, and give people uh, how to do that thing. And by the way, it had nothing to do, it, it was the transfer, right? So you will get examples here and then you're obviously the transfer works to active learning. We will not talk about active learning in this lecture, but the trick is that this all is fundamental knowledge that transfers, okay? So uh, I also would say do not stress out right now um, uh, because yeah, I want you to form a group between one and three people. And of course you're sitting at home and asking yourself, okay, how do I meet people? <laughs> but first of all, I will help with this. I know it's COVID. And second, um, we have Piazza, right? So in Piazza, um, you, you can just go and say, hey, can, can we just meet and talk? So I think um, it's important in this class to, to have a lot of interaction um, with Piazza and also usually we have that in the class and after the class. 
we just can't have it right now, but we will deal with this. Nobody will fail because of this. I mean, this will, this, we will figure this out, okay? Um, in the worst case, everybody does their own project. That's fine with me too, but um, it will be better to do it. It's easier to learn this stuff in a group, okay? And also I may just create uh, uh, workout sessions in Zoom or something. We will figure it out, okay? So, question? Okay, no worries. Um, if you have a question and you have an audio problem, you can always chat, by the way. Um, so the next one is we have weekly homework um, and it's optional, but I highly, highly, highly recommend it, really. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a little nasty, but it's not proof, proof, proof. It's more like think about this, think about that, and then come up with a solution. Um, but really it will improve your understanding um, and your understanding will improve your grade um, for, because you're gonna have a much easier time on your project. That makes sense, right? Um, but again, um, it's optional. Um, so there may be a final exam, um, but this will only be the case if you have Master of Engineering students. As, is, is there any Master of Engineering student in the class right now? doesn't look like it. So since there is no Master of Engineering student in the class, we will not have a final exam. The final exam is needed for Master of Engineering students to get credit. Um, if somebody joins later, we'll have a final exam, which has to be attended only, obviously, by the Master of Engineering student. Okay, we'll have a final exam. <laughs> okay, okay. So now that only uh, is, is, so what happens is, and we will have a final exam and it is optional for anybody to attend, except if you're a master of engineering student, you have to attend it. Now, this is doubly interesting now that we have COVID, um, I will even have to figure out whether we have to have a final exam. Maybe they drop that because, yeah, well, obvious problem, right? But we will get there when we get there because maybe by the end of the year, December, we can, you know, at least sit like socially distant apart with masks I don't know, we'll see. We obviously have to follow whatever guideline is there and um, actually we'll probably follow it even more strict than we get the guideline. Okay, so that's basically where we are um, with this class. And um, the typical homework, by the way, of final exam, just how it look like. It will, for example, ask you, calculate the capacity for different networks. Um, how do you deal with the convolution layer? How does utilization count? Describe what happens if you have too many neurons. Describe what happens if you have a layer too deep. Describe what happens if you use features. These kind of things. Um, you will learn about all of this. And again, the project is choose a project, either yours or somebody else's, or some project of the past. Oh yeah, you can also take a project of the past. Maybe you already have a good project and you say, um, I don't want to do anything new. I just want to pass Gerald's class. And so basically then what you do is you write a report and um, there's 10 questions that I will give you. Um, and these 10 questions will just help you with the, your experimental design. And I'm asking you to judge the success of the project. That sounds a little bit like an essay, okay? But it's not really an essay. It's, it's really a uh, more like I measured this, this is the result. I measured this, this is the result. I measured this, this is the result. So as a conclusion, blah, 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 right? And, and so it's, it's kind of like an essay, but it should be heavily based on measurements. Um, and you absolutely have to comment on the reproducibility. For example, you could find out that it turns out we actually overfit by a factor of five. We really basically have a really nice redundant overfit. We really memorize this totally well, but we don't generalize at all. So the reproducibility is basically zero. We have no it's always completely anecdotal result. And uh, wouldn't be, you wouldn't be the first group who comes to that um, conclusion. Um, so I'm trying to give people more time. I will fight with the administration like I did in previous semesters to give you one extra week, okay? Um, so the point here is though, it is the fall semester. This means it'll go into your Christmas break. Now, should you use the extra week? No, please try to not to, okay? <laughs> I don't want you to have Christmas as my class. Christmas should be Christmas or, or whatever you're celebrating is your holiday, okay? But the major point is, 
If you need it, you have it, okay? And uh, I did this earlier too, because what, I don't, what usually happens is that towards the end of the class, you understand most of these things and it's go, oh my God, I want to, that, that makes so much sense. I should do this, this, and this, and this. And then you have like a week left until the semester and then all your uh, finals start for other classes. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. So I give you another week after those. But if you don't use it, it's better for you, but I will try to be nice. And because the point is that I can push back on the grading deadline a little bit at least. Um, yeah. Just for the logistics that we have right now, any questions? Okay, there are actually some questions. Um, oh yeah, no, that was, yeah. Are there example projects from previous years? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, let me ask two students um, that I'm still in very good contact with. They actually ended up being employee, employees in my startup <laughs> um, to give, if they're okay to release those. So uh, projects like your grades are obviously a FERPA. That means I cannot just share them with anybody, right? Like I couldn't go and say, hey, I don't know, just as great as this, right? This is not okay. <laughs> it's a highly illegal. Um, so uh, just like that, I cannot share projects, but I can obviously ask if somebody wants to have a grade um, uh, shared, then this is okay. Um, obviously, we're not asking about grades, but if they are okay with sharing their projects, I can give them to you. So that is a very good, uh, uh, yeah, I like this a lot. So I will work on that and hopefully get at least one, if not two projects for you. Cool, okay. So then let me give you a glimpse of some of the content from the, for the first half so you get an idea what it's about. Um, don't feel overwhelmed, okay? I will go through this in detail um, and, and step by step. And there's also an online lecture that you can take, uh, which, is, which is there, okay? So um, again, this class sets up to question what's going on right now in machine learning. Again, I've been doing machine learning since 2001, that's 19 years, and I've seen a bunch of stuff. And one thing is really important. What really hurts us is what we think we know, okay? There's a lot of, there's a lot of teaching out there um, that basically says, uh, you know, especially when it comes from commercial people like Google or Amazon, that basically wants you to believe that they're the smartest people on earth. And for example, like so neural networks can be trained to be more intelligent than humans. For example, be Go masters. Okay. Is it really the neural network or is it actually the computational power of the computer underlying, right? And deep learning is better than shallow learning. Okay. Uh, when and why? Oh, no answer. It's just religion? Okay. There's no data like more data. We will get take, I will show you in the next slide that there's no data like more data is a complete lie. Okay, that's just for Google trying to make him being powerful. AI is going to take over the world soon. Now that one, unfortunately, is one where I'm not completely sure I'm wrong, uh, they're wrong. Um, and let's pray to AI, by the way, is not a joke. I didn't give that on the slide as a joke. There is a church of AI in Silicon Valley, okay? So, <laughs> I do not recommend joining that. I'm just saying that's unbelievable if it exists, okay? So I will ask you in this class to do, everybody seen Karate Kid? Just for fun, anybody see Karate Kid? Want to, want to say yes in the chat? Good, I see people nodding, yeah, right? So Karate Kid, the original, Master Miyagi goes and tells the Karate Kid, I feel it's a glass half full, and says, this is your karate, okay? Because he knows, the karate kid knows a little bit of karate before he talks to Mr. Miyagi. And then Mr. Miyagi goes, takes the half full glass, empties it, and says, this is what you have to do with your karate. Basically, forget what, you've, what you know, and I'll teach you from scratch. And what I will do in this class, for at least for the first couple of lectures, I will do exactly that. You can forget for now what you know, and I will teach you from scratch. And of course, obviously, 
once we get further, you'll see everything I say will completely fit into what everybody else is saying too, except it makes it much easier to understand. And it's not hopefully, 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 and I mean, you please be the judge of this, it's not full of fluff. <laughs> because I see a bunch of Google stuff is just full of fluff, okay? I'm sorry, if you work for Google or something, or I'm very sorry. But let's start, let me put the pedal to the metal here, or the, the money on my Let's start with a little game. Let's take the sequence. Two, four, six, eight. What's the next number? Uh, Katie, Katie, did you listen? What's, your next, what's the next number after two, four, six, eight? Ten. Wow, ten. How do you do that? Awesome, right? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Well, the next number after that is obviously twelve. So, Katie, what's the rule? Say that again, sorry. What is the rule, Katie? Um, by twos or evens or... Perfect. So, basically, plus two or evens, right? Yeah. Good job. So, what's the second sequence? Six, five, one, three. Um, I don't know who we, who we take. Chunning. <laughs> what's the next number? Um, I don't know. Really? But this was so easy before, right? No, obviously, you're right. I don't know either, okay? <laughs> so, the point is here that's interesting. So we have two sequences, and in the first sequence, it's, it's really clear the number is plus two, and in the second, we kind of don't know. But here's what's more interesting. If I now give you the number 100,000, what's the next sum number based on the first sequence? 100,002. But what's the next number based on the second sequence? We don't know. And this is the interesting thing about machine learning. So, the first sequence, you were able to easily deduce a rule. Once you have a rule, you don't have to memorize the original numbers, but you can now go and apply the rule to unseen data, like 100,000, right? So now, with the rule, you can generalize, in this case, to an infinite number of correct predictions. Now, in the second case, you don't have the rule. What's the only thing you can do? The only thing you can do with 6513 is memorize 6513. And because you memorize, there's nothing else you can do. When I give you 100,000, there's nothing you can do. More interestingly is this. If I gave you 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, and so on and so forth, so at some point you would say, stop. You know, Katie would say, stop, you're annoying me. <laughs> So I already know the rule, right? I figured it out after 2468. Wait a minute, how does this fit? There's no data like more data. It's not right. It's not like there's more data like more data. It's there's more no data like enough data to infer a rule that generalizes to the unseen examples, okay? So the trick of machine learning is to find a rule that generalizes. And we will talk about the properties of that rule and how that actually works when you do neural networks and the rules they actually infer. So the trick for 6513 is you can memorize 6513. It turns out actually these are the last four digits of my phone number. Phone numbers, unless you pay for them with a 1-800, are exactly just random digits so you can only memorize them. There's nothing else you can do. Alternatively, there's two ways of teaching things. Let's say you want to teach the 101. I mean, the original, like the one times one is one, one times two is two, and so on, right? You can teach that the way I learned it, unfortunately, in school, which is like, just memorize that from one to 10, right? How does it help? Yes, you're fast. Three times four is 12, awesome. But what if somebody gives you 11 times 13? Then you think, um, how did it work again? And that's actually what happens. What we really should be doing is we should tell people the rule of multiplication is repeated addition, right? Three times four is the same as three plus three plus three plus three. And what's interesting here is that memorization makes recall really quick, right? Once you actually memorize. But the trick is with generalization that you can now apply whatever you've learned to unseen data. And that's much more interesting. That's the idea of machine learning. So, 
I'm, I'm hoping this makes sense for now, right? So this is just basically the point. And now I will tell you and I will teach you in this, in this lecture that we can actually measure, given some data and a potential machine learner, how easy it would be for this machine learner to infer a rule rather than to memorize before we even train. Before we even train. That sounds almost impossible, but stay with me and I'll show you. Um, so let's start very basic. What is the scientific process, really? Every science needs to obey the scientific process. The scientific process is I'm Newton and some apple just fell on my head and it freaking hurt. So I got the attention, right? The apple got the attention of Newton. Now that I have Newton's attention and he's a smart cookie, he goes ahead and says, that hurt, but here's what I want to know. A, why did it hurt? And also, would it hurt more if the apple was higher or lower? And how is the hurt proportional to the height of the apple? So what does Newton do first? He drops apples from different heights <laughs> and he measures how much it hurts. And it turns out the hurt is proportional to the height of the apple, okay? Because the hurt is proportional to the energy that he hits, okay? So what we do here is this. We have experiments that give observations. As you drop apples, you can write numbers down and that's an observation. These observations serve you you look at them, you look at them, you look at them until maybe you plot them in a graph or something. You have all these tools for that until you come up with a theory. And that theory says, huh, I can now predict when I take this apple at this high, I will measure this. So it predicts the measurements that you'll make for your experiments, right? That is the scientific process as hopefully everybody has learned in middle school or even earlier, please. If not, we'll learn it now, no worries. But I'm just saying it should be. So that's the scientific process. Now, what's new here? Am I teaching you anything new? Well, first of all, that scientific process is really freaking old. But there are two new things and the reason why this is a computer science class. The first new thing came about in the 50s when we started to use computers for real. Because experiments can be really freaking expensive. For example, and they could also be dangerous. For example, nuclear explosions. Now, nuclear explosions, you don't just drop uh, like you drop apples. You don't drop nukes like you drop apples, okay? You gotta do some really smart way and then maybe try to simulate your theories, see if the observations match. That was called simulation. Simulations are still done using a bunch of compute, uh, for example, in Lawrence Little National Lab, where I worked earlier. Now, that means you have a theory, you get a prediction, and then you have a human observing those predictions and trying to figure out, for example, smoothness and different things, whether that will be right. Now, the other thing, and that's the brand new stuff. That's not, that Luke thing is so last century, okay? Let's talk millennial stuff. <laughs> that is millennial stuff, but we now go and say, wait a minute, what if, I'm so lazy, <clears throat> and what if it's not about the experiments are difficult, but actually I'm lazy. I have a computer. I don't have to think about theory. I can just have to computer train it. Yeah, you can, that's called machine learning. In theory, what happens here is you give experiments to a machine, the observations go in, and we call that training data, and what comes out is a prediction. So what is that else? It's just basically replacing your theory, right? And that's really, really cool. Um, we have to just be careful because now the question is, what's a better theory and what's a worse theory? When is my theory actually valid? And all of these questions now come automatically that are usually solved by the theorist and now have to be solved by the machine learning person. And that makes things hard because two machine learners aren't the same, right? And of course, this is why I go in and say, yeah, guess what? When we design a theory, there is a bunch of philosophy that tells us how to design theories. We should just apply the same philosophy to machine learning. And uh, there's two things to say. First of all, we'll do that. And then second, that little graph right here is my definition of data science. People often say, how is data science defined? We don't even know what data science is. For me, it's pretty clear, data science is the science of automatic, automatizing 
or automating the scientific method. The scientific method has been there for millennia. But what's new is that we can now just basically automatize it or at least help the human by automatizing it. And that's for me what the modern data science is. And why is it even a science? Well, it's a science because it turns out uh, we have observations about how data behaves in general that we can apply to the automation. And that is the science that I'm gonna teach you in the first half of this class. So now let's do this again. We have the scientific method, okay? So we have some guy or woman or kid or anybody who's actually observing, even actually animals do that. They just do it in their brain. Um, but animals usually don't write things down. But at least you have a very natural process here, some person observing something. What is what they do with those observations? They put them in a table, okay? And if you do rigorous scientific experiments, you'll have some kind of input, la la la, this factor, this factor, this factor, and then some kind of outcome. Like, I added this much salt, it tasted awful. I added this much salt, it was okay. I added not enough salt, and it's not, it was awful again. So awful, not awful, awful, not awful. And you see right there how I define a binary classification task, right? But the trick is, yeah, so you have some data and you have some outcome. And now you have people, traditional people like Albert Einstein took data and observations in Einstein's uh, uh, particular one about particles and about um, also about universe, um, astro astronomy. Um, and they look at the table long enough, you know, using their own brain. And when they come up and look at the table long enough or lo looks at the apples falling down long enough at the table until they come up with this. What is this? A formula, right? So what's a formula? Well, a formula represents all the data in the table, right? So what's a formula? Nothing else, but this formula says, you don't have to measure anymore. I can predict what you will measure, right? But the interesting part is, what did this brain here actually do coming up from the data to the formula? Well, let's take a look at what we do in machine learning. We replace the brain with this. <laughs> so inputs, some combinational logic with memory <laughs> and outputs, right? That's what we do. And then we hope that E equals MCV square comes out, right? Um, because we just said that we replaced the theory. Well, can we do that? Are we doing that? Well, right now, we're not. Right now, if you think about computer vision and AlexNet with 238 megabytes of parameters, that's barely a formula that I could call E equals MC squared. That formula was, that takes us 238 megabytes to write down, it's a lot of work to write down. It's not practical for humans. It is practical for computers though. So now the question is, can we do better? Do we actually need 238 megabytes? I don't know. But we'll, we'll take a look at this soon. So let's take, let's go pop one, even one level higher, okay? So instead of the brain, we, as I said, we now have this thing here. This thing was combinational logic and memory, which in computer science theory is called a finite state machine, okay? We don't have infinite memory ever. So it's a finite state machine. Now, what do we know about finite state machines? Well, again, let's pop up one up. So first of all, I don't wanna do science without definitions, okay? Yeah, definitions can get you into trouble, but you're, you're free to choose another class. So <laughs> here's my definition. And this definition about intelligence is from Binet and Simon from 1904. Now who's Binet and who's Simon? Well, I actually can tell you, Binet was the professor and Simon was the student in France trying to figure out how to automatically identify um, learning disabilities in children in the 1900s. Now, is that important for us? It kind of is because as a result, they invented the intelligence, the IQ test. And the IQ test that they invented is still the current IQ test. 
So the Q test is basically um, the Stanford BNA test. If you were to take an IQ test right now, you would take the Stanford BNA test. So a mixture between what BNA and Simon did in 1904 and what some Stanford uh, medical people added to it today. So yes, we can discuss the IQ test. There's a bunch of shortcomings in it. But the one thing is that really sticks and that really works, especially in what we are going about to do, is the definition of the intelligence is the ability to adapt. You should also know that um, they were, uh, what's his name? Um, my God, I'm blanking on him. Uh, the wheelchair professor recently died, astronomist, um, really famous. Somebody put that in the chat. Um, so the famous astronomer physicist Hawking. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hawking, um, Hawking uh, is famously quoted as his definition of his intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. Now, for me, you can go with that definition too if you want. First of all, Hawking never said it, but it doesn't matter to me. If you like the ability to adapt to change better, you can go with that. My major point is the ability to adapt. And now, what do we do in machine learning? Well, in machine learning, we adapt a finite state machine, M, we will just call it thing M, to an unknown function based on observations, okay? So when you program Python, and then the Python is executed in the finite state machine, you adapt the finite state machine to a known function. That's the function you gave it, right, in Python. But when you, um, when you only have the, um, the observations as in form of a table, sorry, you don't even know what the function is. You want the computer to tell you, right? And hopefully the computer can find it. And we will talk about how, how that is. But basically the point is machine learning adapts a finite state machine to an unknown function based on your table of observations. And now your input for that task is in general for any supervised uh, machine learning task is n rows of observation. We call them instances in machine learning if you've done this before. And a ta in a table with a header, right? Where it's like feature one, feature two, feature three, feature M. And then the last uh, one is the target function, right? So that's your table. Um, that's what you do. And um, as you do that, um, your output should map any point from the input to the output. And what we're hoping is that it actually generalizes. And that means that any point from the input uh, is not only mapped to the output, but also points we haven't seen are mapped to the right output. And this is now the whole point is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. As this thing sees 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, it should say, ah, 12 is also even, but 11 is not, right? And with 6, 5, 1, 3, you basically can only store a lookup table, right? So yes, this table here is a lookup table. Input in, output out, but we want to be better than the lookup table, okay? And now um, we will do everything in this next couple lectures. We'll only deal with binary classifiers and balanced classes. We will, we will uh, loosen this requirement soon, later because I do realize that your projects would be kind of limited if you only dealt with binary classes that are balanced, especially in real life tasks, they're never really balanced. Um, but here's the major point. So what you can do is you can assume um, that all the inputs are just real numbers, whatever, but they're also not because we have a computer, but you can. And then also um, your output for now, for, for, for the next couple lectures is always going to be zero or one, cat or dog, uh, good, bad, up, down, whatever you can think of, okay? Just make it binary. And so the trick is what we want is we want to take this lookup table that we created based on our observations and convert it into something computational that is able to predict our values, right? And so the first thing that I'm asking here from the theory part is, as I have a lookup table, how many state transitions in my finite state machine do I actually need to model this table? Okay, so if I think about this as state transitions, in general, how many do I need? Okay, so 
What's the first trick? Can we just, just think about it? Any, any, any guess? Right. So the, the, the trivial state machine would be, you take this as an input and then draw one arrow and this is the output, right? So the trivial state machine would just be input, arrow, output, input, arrow, output, input, arrow, output for each row. Okay, so for a table of size one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows, you would need seven arrows, <laughs> right? Or you could also say for a table of seven rows, you need seven rows of a lookup table, okay? Now the question is, what does a lookup table do with unseen data? Nothing. With unseen data, you're just out of luck. It doesn't know what to find. It will say out of bounds or it, it will not find it. So what do we need to do? We need to find some patterns in the left side such that we can combine rows into the same arrow, right? And again, I said this is very quick right now. There's a whole online lecture on this that I actually will give you as a homework um, because we, we run out of time. So now, I will give you a little bit of the math behind it. Now, Shannon said, information is reduction of uncertainty. That's first of all very important. And so what it means is, for us of computer science scientists, when we have a number like five, we take log two of five, and then we know how many bits that number needs to be represented. But what's also interesting is, is so if we have, um, uh, probability, then minus log one divided by five is the same number of bits, right? So log of log two of five is the same as minus log two of one divided by five. Okay, and what this means is the following: if you have your table, and each output, right, or each input-output sequence, is sort of Equally distributed, right? So let's say it's a coin toss, right? So your input is, um, I don't know, all the factors you know about the coin toss, right? Which thumb did you use? Uh, how, which coin it is also on? And you toss the coin and guess what? The output is head tails. Then it turns out you will not be able to predict that coin toss because that's what a coin toss is for. It's unpredictable. So that means the information you gain from each row in the coin toss example would be one bit, head or tail, right? But if it's something predictable, it depends on something, then you actually may, get, may gain less or more information, okay? So how much memory something takes to memorize is defined by the Shannon entropy and by default, you just take the log, but if you want to take into account the dependencies between different things, you actually take into account the probability distribution, and then you get to the Shannon entropy, okay? Um, now, what often happens in other machine learning classes is that since we don't know the distribution, we will assume a distribution. We will assume, for example, the Gaussian distribution. Yes, I, I, I get it, because that allows you to work with it but we will not do this in this class. We will never assume a distribution. In this class, instead, we will measure the dependency and we will not know what the distribution is, but knowing the dependency helps us to size our network. We will know, well, we cannot do better than a lookup table, or we can say, oh, we can do much, much better than a lookup table. And that is actually good because if it turns out you can do much, much better than the training data you were given, that means you should start training a machine learning on it and create some generalizable results, okay? So the, the thought framework is exactly what I just said. You take your table, you convert it into a finite state uh, a machine, and then you ask yourself, how many state transitions do I need? And maximally, you should only need as many state transitions as are in that lookup table, as I just said. But minimally, you don't know. Minimally, 
it's kind of difficult to say, but you can measure it empirically. And that's the interesting part. So I'm giving you a couple more uh, sort of overview of what you learned in this class. So we just said intelligence is the ability to adapt. Now what we will talk, call capacity is the number of unique target functions a machine learner is able to adapt to. Okay, that means how adaptable is something. So let me give you an example that may be a little interesting. So I talked to a physicist friend from Caltech um, and he said, the problem with the definition of intelligence is the ability to adapt is that if as I slip into my underwear, uh, the elastic expands and adapts to my body shape. So does that mean that my underwear is intelligent? <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> that doesn't mean that, but it is more intelligent the underwear that doesn't have an elastic because that underwear cannot adapt to your body. And the trick here is why is a smartphone smart compared to a regular phone? Well, because you can install apps and adapt it to your needs, right? So what's really smart, the phone or the user of the phone? Well, we will learn soon that these boundaries are made by society. In reality, it is the ability to adapt. And so what it means is, yes, your underwear is intelligent, but obviously it's only one parameter of intelligence, okay? <laughs> While your brain has a bunch of parameters of intelligence, so you are absolutely much smarter than your underwear, okay? But interestingly enough, your phone also has a bunch of parameters. And now the question is, what if you play Go against your phone? Well, it may actually beat you. And that's where we come from. So basically the trick is the number of unique target functions that you can adapt to um, is the intellectual capacity, okay? And we just have to make this as, as, a, uh, as a definition because obviously there could be others, but this is the mathematical one. And now becomes the major trick. The major trick, and again, we will discuss this in way more depth next time, and there's also a homework lecture you should take a look at is that we define something called memory equivalent capacity. A machine learner's memory, uh, a machine learner's intellectual capacity, that means the number of unique target functions can adapt, is memory equivalent to n bits when the machine learner is able to represent all to the power of n binary labeling functions of the f n points, right? Of, they could be uniformly random or not, right? I say uniformly random, we will talk about uniform random soon. But the major point is, once you have that definition, it just means if I have a memory equivalent capacity of 10 bits in my machine learner, it means it will be able to memorize or, or adapt to any table of size 10 rows, right? It can overfit this table with 10 rows, right? But the point is we don't want to overfit, so that means is we hopefully find a machine learner with lower memory equivalent capacity than the number of training samples that we have. And by doing this, we just found out what we do with 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, okay? The important trick here is this. Memorization, memory adapts to, so n bits of memory can adapt to any of two to the power of n states, right? We know this from bits, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, two to the power of n combinations, all combinations uh, can be adapted to. So memory is actually intelligent. But we also know the lookup table, which is just memory, does not generalize. So memorization is worst case generalization. This is how we will look at this, okay? So now, if we deduce nothing from data, the only thing we can do is memorize the observations we have attempt. Okay, so what this means is, 6513, you can memorize that, but you don't know anything. You can't deduce anything. You cannot get anything out of it. But 2468, you were able to say plus two. Now the rule plus two is really finite, right? It's plus two. I don't know how many bits that takes, but it's just a couple of bits. Well, these couple of bits can generalize to an infinite amount of numbers that you can now say belongs to the sequence or not. With 6513, because you don't have a rule, you know nothing. All you can do is memorize 6513, right? And now we will make an assumption 
Okay, and that's our engineering assumption. It's not necessarily mathematically or even scientifically true. We will make this assumption for the rest of the class because we want to measure. We will say, if we use as many parameters as needed for memorization or more in our machine learner, then we didn't deduce anything and we're overfitted. Okay, now why is this an assumption? This is an assumption because what if somebody goes and says, yeah, you say the rule for 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 is plus 2, but my rule is plus 0.1, plus 0.1, plus 0.1, and so on. So it sums up to 2. Now, that's a really long rule, and that rule is longer than it, in memory, definitely, than 2, 4, 6, 8. And what I'm saying, if you have such a long rule, you're most likely overfitting, except I just gave you a counterexample. Now, what I will do is I say, yes, you may not be overfitting when your rule is longer than your training data. But I would say, let's find a rule that's shorter. Let's make that an engineering principle to find a rule that is shorter than your lookup table, because then I can guarantee you that you're not overfitting. OK, that's how we will work. Now, reducing parameters below memory capacity will in the best case, even make the machine learner forget what's not relevant with regards to the target function and that we call generalization. So generalization is abstraction. It is forgetting bits. You, when you do two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, it doesn't even matter. The funny thing is I can take Nadia and ask her two, four, six, eight, what's the next one? She says 10. And I can take Aryun and I can go and say 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and say, what's the next one? You say 20. And the funny thing is you both learned the rule plus two, despite the fact that I trained you on different data, right? And that's the funny thing. It doesn't matter if Arjun or not, what, how Arjun and how Nadia learned the rule. But after they knew the rule, they could apply it. And that means that in the best case, we abstract enough that we even forget the original input data. Right? So we don't want to memorize at all. We want to really just reduce it to nothing. And then we know we are absolutely generalized. Right? And now, given the second bullet point assumptions, we can define generalization as the number of correctly classified instances. When you, and that's only valid, by the way, measured in bits when you have uh, balanced binary classes. Okay. So the number of correctly classified instances divided by the memory equivalent capacity. So what this does, this will be one, right, for the lookup table. So if you have 10 rows with, you know, uh, five zeros and five ones, then, and we, we do the lookup table right, then it will take us 10 state transitions um, to, that basically would be 10 bits um, of memory equivalent capacity to get 10 entries of the table right. So 10 divided by 10 is one, right? And that means, oops, we're memorizing. But what if we don't do that? What if we actually not memorizing? But what if we actually want to generalize? Well, guess what? Then we want G to be much, 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 much larger than one. I can tell you practical results, G100, awesome. G2000, awesome. G35,000, problem mostly solved. And yes, we have G20,000 sometimes easily. And for images, you totally should get that, okay? But often, when you now take AlexNet, the 238 megabytes of parameters, you will see that they are more like close to one and sometimes actually below one. That means each parameter, it, that means they're worse than a lookup table. Each parameter takes more uh, is basically less than one row in the, in the training. Um, yes, so some question. I think I've heard something similar in Josh Tenenbaum's concept learning where longer, more complex hypothesis concepts are assumed to be less likely prior to observing any data. Yes. So, and I didn't say the magic word yet, uh, Ravina, this is really right. Uh, it's not Josh Tenenbaum, it's Occam's razor. Okay. So, the reason why I impose this is not only that you can now measure this, but it's also, it's Occam's razor. And I can tell you as an engineer, you want the car with four wheels, 
why not five or six or 10? Well, because basically the ideal machine has zero parts. You want the most simple, simple machine you can build to do the trick. Therefore, you want the least parameters of machine learning to do the trick. It's Occam's razor because you want the smallest hypothesis that explains your phenomena. That's Occam's razor. Um, we'll talk about GMEM in a, in a little bit. There's a pr um, I, let me explain GMEM in the next lecture, okay? Because it, it gets a little more complicated than this formula, unfortunately. Um, and that is actually explained in McKay, if you wanna, if you wanna go a little bit uh, into this. Um, um, but since it's 12, I just have to, uh, I have to just unfortunately push it to the next lecture. But the major point is, the trick here is, as engineers, we want the smallest hypothesis. You have heard this before in your computer science studies. studies. Keep it simple, stupid. And that's also true for machine learning. And once you do that, uh, you can derive these things. Now, two things as a preview for this class. First one is this. Go to tfmedia.icsi.berkeley.edu. That is a tool where I show you various measurements that will be defined in this lecture. And you can just build neural networks to train various things. And as you do so, you see measurements go up and down. And it actually gives you the memory equivalent capacity of the network that you built, and also sort of capacity demands for various data sets on the left. Um, that's something I would like to give you a homework, just play around with it. I will introduce this tool in the next lecture. And I said no homework this week, but really what I, uh, it's no traditional homework. What I want you to do is if you could watch this lecture, that'll give you, uh, I, I recorded this, but this gives you uh, a 20 minute more compact, but also in the same way, better explanation than slides because I use a whiteboard. Um, the same stuff I just explained to you with generalization, okay? So that will help you further your understanding. You see it from a different angle. And once you've seen the lecture, I think it would be great for you to just take a look at the TF Meter app um, to just get familiar with this. And I will just stop because it is 12. But if anybody has any questions, um, um, yeah, please ask them. Thank you so much, by the way. Um, it's all hard with COVID. These slides will be posted and this lecture is recorded. And actually, I will now stop the recording so that you can ask questions that are off the grid.